I would like to thank Laura and Keith Baston for the Safari Limited Archaeopteryx, and I'd like to thank the people who sent me the Papo Archaeopteryx, except I don't actually know who sent these, so if these were you, comment in and we will thank you properly. I've been wanting to do Archaeopteryx for some time. Because it has been in the public eye for so long as the archetypal of alien, the, the first bird, the missing link between dinosaurs and birds, that uh, or in, before about the 1980s, the missing link between reptiles and birds, uh, uh, there's been a tendency to restore it as a long-tailed bird with a reptile face and reptile hands sticking out of its wings, which is not super reflective of its biology. I, I think this is part of a bigger problem with not so much paleontologists, but definitely we the public and partially paleoartists, that because it is the missing link between dinosaurs and birds, we, we want to emphasize the reptilian parts and we want to emphasize the bird-like parts and really drive home that it's, that it's bridging this gulf that it turns out doesn't really exist. Um, if we look at Archaeopteryx in its actual phylogenetic context and, and look at the phylogeny from the, the basal paravians to what we call crown birds, we, we can get a better picture of both the appearance and the biology of Archaeopteryx. Because for a long time, it was assumed that because this is a bird, it would have flapping flight. It would be raising its young. It would have a avian endothermic metabolism, and it would grow up very quickly. But if you're going to make inferences about those things, you need to be more granular in your approach to, to taxonomy. You can't just say, well, this is a bird, therefore X, Y, Z. Archaeopteryx is from the Solnhofen Formation in what is today Bavaria, Germany. This is early Tythonian, which is late Jurassic period, about 151 million years ago. At that time, Europe, as we know it, was an archipelago in a shallow sea and dotted throughout that were these lagoons where the waters were sheltered from the open ocean by these huge reefs rising you know, 50 meters off the seafloor. This isolated the deep waters of the lagoons from the flow of water, and because the area was pretty arid, the earth was hotter then, and also even in the rainy season, this part of the world just didn't get that much rainfall. Surface evaporation, made the depths of these lagoons really saline, really salty. Uh, and if you have too much salt, nothing can live down there. We find very few arthropod trackways. We find enough arthropod carcasses, and e sometimes you'll have a trackway made by like a horseshoe crab, and then at the end of it, you have the horseshoe crab dead. So nothing was living down there to disturb the, the bottom of the, of the sea. So anything that floated down, anything that was dead and floated down, didn't decay any further once it got down there. It was like it was pickled. Um, and because it laid there undisturbed, carbonate particles filtered down and laid down this extremely fine, extremely uniform limestone, which is useful for humans if we want to use it for lithographic printing. So while we were quarrying uh, this rock, we kept finding really well-preserved fossils. And because the animal didn't decompose so much, these fossils included feather traces and, and soft tissue traces that we wouldn't otherwise get. And we actually find quite a lot of Archaeopteryx food, uh, small reptiles and insects. Um, you might not be aware of this, but Archaeopteryx was a fairly large animal. It was like the size of a big crow, about a half a meter long, including the tail. So we have abundant, diverse land insects, we have lizard relatives and tuatara relatives, and we have larger animals. We have crocodile relatives, we have a lot of pterosaurs, 
uh, and we have Compsognathus, which was found a couple of years before Archaeopteryx. It was in 1861 that the first specimen that we recognized as such of Archaeopteryx was found, right after we found a isolated single feather, which is going to be important later. It was sold to the Natural History Museum in London, and so it's called the London Specimen. It was described by Sir Richard Owen, who I really thought we would have mentioned more by now. Uh, and eventually it was made the neotype of Archaeopteryx lithographica. It was universally and immediately recognized as a bird because it had feathers, and in Linnaean taxonomy, if it has feathers, it's a bird. But the newfangled theory of evolution by natural selection uh, found a lot of support in this specimen. The uh, author, Charles Darwin, uh, noted that this is a prime example of how little we know about the history of life and how it can still surprise us. Because the conventional wisdom at the time was that birds had emerged abruptly in the Eocene, and, and here's a Jurassic bird. In 1875, another specimen was on Earth. This one had a skull. It was actually a much more complete specimen. Uh, that wasn't described until 1884, and the reason for that time gap is that the gentleman who wound up owning the specimen was maybe asking for too much. In today's dollars, he was asking for about two and a half million, uh, and no museum wanted to pay. But Ernst Siemens, uh, of a certain notable corporation, bought it and then sold it to the Humboldt Museum in Berlin, so this is called the Berlin Specimen. Uh, another decade after it was described, it was erected as its own species, Archaeopteryx siemensii. I mention this because I think the Safari Limited toy here is supposed to be the Berlin specimen, Siemensii. Um, there are other species of Archaeopteryx that have been named, but as is so often the case, we're fairly certain that those are all growth stages of already named species. Did I mention that most of the stem bird fossils we find from Solnolfen are juveniles? Because that confounds things. Interestingly, this is one of the few non-avian dinosaurs to have a common name. Uh, we don't just call it Archaeopteryx, you can also call it Orofogel, which means basically the same thing as Archaeopteryx anyway, but still, it's kind of cool, Orofogel. I would first like to note how beautifully detailed the Papo figure here is. They've gone to all this trouble to show very different textures for the coverts versus the body fluff versus the remiges versus the scaly bits, and that's really admirable. Unfortunately, a lot of those details are wrong, uh, it's kind of heartbreaking, because they, they go to this trouble to portray it really quite realistically, but then they stick a lizard head on it. The other basal paravians tell us that the primitive condition for Archaeopteryx would have been a feathery face and a feathered neck. I, I, I don't actually know what this naked lizard neck is, is based on, but uh, it's not impossible, but it's not as reasonable as assuming that it just kept feathers there. It's interesting, the uh, the slightly worse quality Papo figure I have here comes out ahead. <laughs> um, because it's all blue. It's, it's just been painted all one color, so you can just imagine that the feathers are continuing up into the head. I don't know what they're basing this crest of red quills on. As far as I know, there is no evidence of such a thing. Not totally unreasonable either. Just, it, it seems like they've done that just to give it a fiercer appearance that I, I don't think it really needs. <laughs> like, you don't need to try so hard to show, look at how interesting this animal is. It's, it's interesting on its own. Both of these have a pretty emaciated looking neck. They have sort of a, a heron approach to the neck where you have the feathers tightly bound around the surface, whereas there should be more volume there. You shouldn't see this transition between the, the head and the neck being all sharp and, and concave. Also, long, pinaceous feathers on the neck. The, the safari toy seems to have just dino fuzz. You have no doubt noticed that these are both standing on their tails. I noticed that the, the in both cases you can sort of get them to not stand on their tails if you're careful, or maybe if I bend it a little, but uh, obviously it wouldn't be using its tail as a limb, 
but the above vertical orientation of the body is not inaccurate. There's a trend that starts way back at the, the base of the theropoda and continues all the way through birds that the center of mass of the creature moves forward and the balance of the creature moves from being at the hip to being at the knee. Uh, the trade-off in that is that if you're balancing on your knee, you kind of have to be small in size or else it's going to be really energetically costly. But for its position on the tree, it, it's reasonable for Archaeopteryx to hold its body this way. That said, the body, the body should really have the deep chested look like a Manoraptoran. It didn't have a bird thorax yet. It didn't, uh, it, it wasn't adapted for flapping flight the way more derived birds were, but it didn't have this coelophysis looking basal theropod torso going on, and it, it needs a prominent ischial boot, which the safari toy definitely has. That's this bump that happens when the hip bone juts out underneath the legs. As with the neck, both of these toys are portraying dino fluff or proto feathers where as far as we know, it was full panaceous feathers contouring the body. Moving from body to tail, the transition should be pretty abrupt, like on this toy, whereas the more primitive theropod condition has the tail tied into the back legs with the cautifemoralis muscle that I keep going on about. But as you move up the bird family lineage, you see more independent control of the tail at the cost of less power to the back legs. And the reason it needed control of the tail is that it had full asymmetrical remages, uh, two per vertebrae moving down the entire tail. Uh, both of these portray that pretty accurately, though the safari toy, I think, has a more accurate tail length, even though its feathers are probably too short. Now, those tail feathers would actually provide lift. There was a study where they built a full-scale model of the Berlin Archaeopteryx and put it in a wind tunnel, and they found that the tail would provide a lower takeoff velocity. As of the 11th specimen of Archaeopteryx, it seems that the, the tip of the tail would not have a more or less complete fan on it. It would have a, a notch. It would still be V-shaped at the very tip. It had a fork unless that was a taphonomic artifact. The feet on the capo are too short, the, the foot bone between the ankle and the toes, and they seem to have gone to a lot of trouble to make it look theropod-like, whatever that means. Uh, they make it look like a classical dinosaur foot, though I do like the tarsal scoots. But the Safari winds up looking more bird-like and therefore more accurate, but they have a reversed hallux, which is no longer supported. As of the 10th Thermopolis specimen of Archaeopteryx, we have a good look at the actual joints of the foot bones that we didn't have before. Um, previous specimens showed what looked like a reversed hallux, that is a, a first toe pointing backwards, um, but it turns out that was a taphonomic artifact that happened as a result of the animal being dead. It couldn't do that in life. In life, they would be spread medially. So a reversed hallux usually implies that the animal is adapted for an arboreal lifestyle, whereas Archaeopteryx seems to be only facultatively arboreal, which is consistent with what we know about the Solnhofen ecosystem. Uh, there were small plants, there were up to about three meter high plants maximum, but there were no trees with trunks as far as we can tell. So this is an animal that's flitting through desert-adapted uh, fern-like conifers and cycadoids and stuff like that, not, not an animal that's jumping from tree to tree. The hyperextendable second toe, the, the velociraptor-looking claw on the safari toy, uh, it turns out is accurate. As of the Thermopolis specimen, we know that the groove from the second phalanx to the next was much higher than it needed to be unless it was holding its toe up in the air like this. Now, Archaeopteryx had been restored this way for a while, uh, especially as a point of comparison with Deinonychus or, or other Manoraptorans, but it's pretty cool when new evidence 
uh, supports a reasonable hypothesis. There is one thing I like about the Papo Toys feet, though. They, they seem to have padding. There was a very recent study where they shot laser beams at a specimen of Anchiornis uh, to get a look at soft tissues that we couldn't see with the naked eye, and one of those soft tissues was the pads on the bottoms of its feet, which, first off, they had uh, tuberculate scales like a bird would have, like we've been restoring for other dinosaurs, which is cool. Uh, and it had a bit of a fleshy pad, which is not represented on the safari toy. This one has the more basal, salurosaur-looking dino fuzz on its legs, whereas the safari has full panaceous feather trousers, which is more accurate. The color of the scaly bits of the feet and the other scaly bits of the creatures is interesting because we've got two different tropes at work here. There's a tendency recently that if you have a feathered dinosaur, you make its scaly bits yellow or orange, because that's what modern birds, or at least the modern birds that are most familiar to humans have. Uh, whereas on Archaeopteryx, if you want to emphasize, hey, it's got these reptile parts sticking out of a bird body, well, you make them green or, or greenish brown. Um, personally, I think it's most reasonable to just have them be similar in color to the feathers surrounding them, since their scales were of similar material to their feathers. Also, I think it just looks nicer. But that's a neat segue into color, which we can actually talk about for Archaeopteryx, and isn't that cool? We, uh, I mentioned this in the feathers episode, but when I was a lad, we couldn't talk about color in dinosaurs, or at least we could only make educated guesses based on, you know, well, these are the colors birds are, and these are the color crocodiles are, but we have actual evidence now for structural colors because some people looked at the counter slab of that original isolated feather of Archaeopteryx, and they determined that it was uh, one of these. It was one of the coverts coming off of the, the finger or the hand and they looked at it under a scanning electron microscope uh, for melanosomes. They, they wanted to see if it had enough melanin to exhibit structural color, and they found that it did. It was black. Um, now, why was it black? Well, the most obvious answer would be for display, because color, display, that makes sense. Well, why then does the color extend all the way up the feather, even into parts of the feather that would be obscured by other feathers? Um, it's possible that it was for protection against feather-rotting bacteria, but those might not have been enough of a problem in the arid Solnhofen environment to, to create selection pressure. Uh, the most reasonable explanation seems to be that it was for strengthening the feather. Um, melanin is a large polymer, so when you have those melanosomes on a keratin structure, it makes it more resistant to fracture and it just makes the fibers thicker. Uh, this is why on both of these toys you see, uh, and on living birds, you see darkened tips on otherwise light feathers, because that's the part that takes the most beating, it's, it's the most uh, prone to wear, and having a lot of melanin in there uh, resists that. Which makes it weird that the Retresses on the papo, which would also take a beating, don't have the darkened tips, but I'll take what I can get. Now, mind you, just because that one feather was black does not necessarily mean that the entire creature was black, even though you definitely could restore the entire creature black. Um, I don't personally think that the rest of the color scheme of the papo one is necessarily uh, wrong. It's definitely bold. I notice that the safari has this blue sheen on top of the black. I don't know if that's trying to represent iridescence, but there was a recent study that uh, got a lot of press about Microraptor having iridescent feathers. We don't have evidence of that in Archaeopteryx, but since it appears in Microraptor, it's not completely unreasonable that Archaeopteryx could have expressed that. We just don't know yet. The hands on both of these are not very good. On Safari, they're just too small, they're too short. Archaeopteryx had huge hands proportional to its arm length. Papo is pretty bad all around, though. For starters, it's got that old-fashioned trope of it's just kind of a whole, almost pterosaur-looking hand sticking out of the end of the wing, uh, whereas the feathers should be anchored to the second finger. Um, 
I do like that both of these show the third finger crossing over the second, which is supported by the fossil evidence that that was free of the rest of the wing to actually move. Neither shows feathers on the thumb on the first finger because this didn't have the bastard wing or a lula. Not that that would affect its aerodynamic performance. The uh, wind tunnel study I mentioned earlier showed that even an unfeathered thumb could adjust the, the stream of air over the wing. Speaking of adjusting airflow, that Anchiornis study that I mentioned with the laser beams showed a propatagium, the bit of flesh that runs from the shoulder to the wrist in modern birds was already present in the basal paravians. So that's sort of implied in both of these, I think as a result of trying to make the wing look wing-like, but good on ya. Uh, that affects how the air flows over the part of the wing that is not directly controlled by the fingers. So it's very important. Regarding the primaries, the Papo toy has them spread out and curving in an interesting way. I don't know if that's supposed to be representing that the quills of the feathers, the, the rakis, are not as solid as they would be on a modern bird because that is no longer accurate. They would be comparable to other birds as far as stiffness goes, but this might be just an artistic way to show, well, it's, it's spreading and rotating its primary feathers uh, as part of an upstroke. Uh, but they, they couldn't do that super accurately because it would make the toy too complicated. Uh, in that case, okay, cool. Uh, the primaries on the Papo are too long though, I think. Um, this looks like a much more derived animal, like a Confuciornis wing or something, where the, the primaries are really long. Um, Archaeopteryx, all told, had pretty small wings for such a big bird. Longrich suggested that the coverts on Archaeopteryx were really long. He suggested that this was an intermediate condition between what we see in Anchiornis, where the, the feathers on the wing are pretty poorly differentiated, uh, and animals like Confuciornis, where they're uh, uh, really short coverts and really long primary feathers, while Archaeopteryx has, has in the middle, where the coverts are almost as long as the remiges. That has not been super well supported by other authors, but neither toy here portrays it that way anyway. I do like that both are so detailed that you can actually see that the remiges are asymmetrical. The, the quill is off-center to the feather, which is an important structural adaptation for making an airfoil. At this point, I have mentioned a bunch of aerodynamic surfaces on this animal, and that leads to the natural question, could it fly? Well, that's been a subject of some debate. Uh, it lacks the ossified sternum, that is the, the bony breastbone that more derived birds have, which seems to mean that it wouldn't have the muscles for flapping. Uh, there's been debate about whether it would have the range of motion for flapping. Its shoulder socket doesn't seem to accommodate a full flap stroke, uh, though the shoulder is higher on the creature than we previously thought, and maybe a different muscle group was enlarged than in living birds, because remember, this isn't necessarily the ancestor of living birds. It, it might have diverged in some meaningful ways, uh, but we're just not sure about that. Really, the question of locomotion in Archaeopteryx falls under the same tokenism that, that goes into a lot of assumptions about this animal. We assume that because it's Archaeopteryx, it's the first bird, whatever it's doing to get around must be whatever was, was the origin of flight. So if you think that flight is a result of learning to glide, then it was a glider. If you think it was a result of learning to run quickly and, and maneuver on the ground, then that's what it was doing. Current thinking is the ontogenetic transitional wing. It, it, it's fancy biologists speak for a partially evolved wing works the same way as a partially grown wing on a young bird today. So the animal is navigating a 3D substrate. It's, it's quasi-arboreal, like we were talking about how there's no trees to move around in, but it's going from bush to rock to ground. Uh, and the even the, the crappily feathered and partially functional wings and other aerodynamic surfaces would help it to maneuver and maybe to flap to get a burst of speed or to 
uh, wing-assisted inclined run up a surface, uh, or indeed to, to parachute slightly. So there's no one behavior that we can point to and say, oh, this is what it was doing that eventually led to flight. And I'm going to quote directly from Hutchinson and Allen here, which I don't usually do, but it's an it's a enlightening quote. The recognition that extant birds use varying degrees of aerodynamic forces in substrate-based locomotion also provides a plausibly seamless adaptive continuum between running and flying, with the consequence that attempts to define any one phylogenetic node as the transition between the two may be futile. Put another way, evolution is a branching process. It is not a linear sequence of organisms. Those diagrams we show every episode explaining what dinosaurs are related to what are called cladograms. And if we want to understand why exceptional Rosetta Stone specimens like Archaeopteryx are so important, we're going to take a simplified look at how those are constructed. Traits are made up of characters with states. A character is some feature we can define for an organism. In paleontology, this is usually a particular part of a bone or the articulation between bones, but more recently, especially for dinosaurs, we've been seeing more soft tissue structures like feathers being used as, as characters. I'm going to show this as a simple shape. In phylogenetics, this is a dimension of an array, so we're going to have multiple shapes for a single node. The characters of a trait have states or conditions. This is at least two mutually exclusive forms the character can take, and I'll represent that with a color. Now this can be as simple as it walks on those legs, or as complex as uh, qu bite partate quadrate articulation. A homology is a trait that is shared between taxa, though the other traits in those taxa might be very different. So if all you do is compare state sets and character matrices, you're going to get nice, neat groups of taxa, but you're not going to know how they're evolutionarily related. This is as far as Linnaean taxonomy can get us. So how do we know which, if either, is retaining the old character states and which has evolved new ones? Well, we say that one is ancestral and one is derived. A derived trait, or an innovation, is called an apomorphy. If nothing else expresses that state, that's an autapomorphy, but if other ones do, it's a connective derivation that's called a synapomorphy. This shows that these taxa share a common ancestor, which also have that apomorphy. So when an organism or taxon shares a synapomorphy with a taxon, that is a sister taxon. It's the closest relative of those organisms. So a derived trait is an apomorphy, a ancestral trait is a plesiomorphy. It's the, the default condition. A symplesiomorphy is when you share plesiomorphy between taxa. Despite the morphological similarity, just having a symplesiomorphy doesn't necessarily mean that the two taxa sharing it are sister taxa. This is all relative. A, a, a synapomorphy in a higher clade might be a symplesiomorphy in, in a lower clade. I've been assuming that this is the ancestral organism of this tree, but you may have noticed that it could just as easily be a sister taxon of either of these other two. You might say to just look at which is older, but logically, the, the specimens we find are not going to be the direct ancestors of any other organisms we've found. Uh, like, Archaeopteryx lived 27 million years before Sinosauropteryx, but it's much more derived. To tell what's an ancestral trait and what's a derived trait, we need an outgroup. The in-group is the clade we've been working with this whole time. An out-group is a related clade that we're not working with, and I'm showing this as if it's the closest relative, but it's just for simplicity. It's actually better to have an out-group that's rather more distant. Homologies between the in-group and out-group show us what the common ancestor of those groups had. It shows us our plesiomorphies. So changing the out-group can completely change the tree. You'll notice on this tree, we've got a trait that's the same in two different, only distantly related parts of the tree. That is called a homoplasy, which make everything difficult. These are coincidentally homologous traits, that they look like synapomorphies. For instance, bird-like hips, where the, the pubis is running roughly parallel to the ischium, evolved four separate times in the dinosauria. So how do we tell whether our tree is accurate when homoplasies show up? Uh, well, it works better if we have larger arrays of characters. We're only using a few, but you want dozens, if not hundreds. Um, but we check the number of changes at each step of the tree. 
the, we score the tree, uh, uh, and the lowest score is probably the most parsimonious. And since the simplest answer is the one we go with in science, that's the tree we're going to go with. So what does all this have to do with Archaeopteryx? Well, everything. Uh, Archaeopteryx is pretty clearly a bird. It's, it's showing bird-like character states, but it's also showing Maniraptoran dinosaur character states. It, it's, it's a matrix that can completely change our phylogen phylogenetic tree. Um, and as I hope I have clearly and consistently communicated on this show, studying dinosaurs in that context as stem birds uh, uh, has revolutionized our understanding of these animals. And I know it's sometimes easy to look at all of the constant revisions that are happening at the, the basal Paravians, what with all the new discoveries, and say, well, these scientists can't make up their minds. The big picture relationships, the major groupings, are pretty well supported, and they've been pretty stable for, for a number of years. And we definitely have an idea of what the transitions are. There are gaps in the fossil record, and the transition from dinosaurs to birds was extremely fast, uh, uh, geologically speaking. But we can use phylogenetics to look at when these individual traits emerged. Is the hypothetical node animal closer to 3 kilograms in mass, or has it shrunk to 800 grams? Has the center of the mass stayed at the back so that the animal balances at the hip, or is it forward so that the animal's balancing at the knee? Uh, where does the shoulders balance come from? Is it from muscle force or, or from the ligament between the humerus and the coracoid or, or some combination? Are there panaceous feathers on the shin? Uh, what about the foot? Do they form hind wings or is that function taken over by the tail fan? Is the tail still long with retresses all along it or has it developed a pyga style where, where the tail is short and the, the distal vertebrae are all fused and does it have a tail fan? And are that pygostyle and tail fan basically the same as modern morphology, or are they more primitive? How strongly does the caudifemoralis tie the legs in with the tail? Is the animal prioritizing hind limb power or, or fine tail control? How well differentiated are the flight feathers from the coverts? And how asymmetrical are the flight feathers? Are the torso and the pectoral girdle modified for powered flight? Does the animal still have its gastralia, the, the belly ribs? Does it have teeth? Does it have a beak? Does it have both? They are not mutually exclusive. Are the fingers a hand or a wingtip or some combination of them? The collection of traits that we humans think of as defining birds are actually derived dinosaurian traits that arose not independently of one another, but certainly not exclusively in modern birds. So if you think that birds are so clearly different from their dinosaurian relatives that they shouldn't be called dinosaurs, uh, I ask you, what does that mean for Stegosaurus or Brontosaurus? Like, why does dinosaur diversity only cause us to call them something different when it's making them more familiar to us? As humans, we love having neat, tidy little categories for the information we're taking in. To an extent, we need that. We need to compress information so our brain can work with it. But life does not give us that luxury. Life is a writhing, messy, iterative, beautiful experiment. And we need to appreciate the results of that experimentation on their own merits, as well as for the insights they can give us into their, their relatives. And I can't think of a better place to start than with Archaeopteryx. <laughs> and thank you for watching Your Dinosaurs Are Wrong. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Comment with dinosaurs you'd like me to have on the show. You could even send me a toy dinosaur. Our address is in the description. But I do ask that you not send in a genus we've already done. Uh, and if you need your toy back, please specify. Go to thegeekgroup.org to find out more about our National Science Institute and get involved. And we'll see you next time.